here for once and perhaps the only time in literary history, uh, political ideology generated an enormous mass literary effort. Now that we have established at least sufficient to our purposes what the political mechanisms were, we now turn our attention to the literature that was generated. Now, before I initiate my own discussion, this might be a good time to throw open the floor to those of you who have gotten far enough in your reading to have developed uh, some thoughts about our subject, or more to the point, some questions. Uh, if there are any specific aspects of your reading to date that you want to talk about, or particular thoughts that have come to you that you think are worth sharing, this might be a good time to do that. Does anybody want to talk about anything whatsoever? Yeah, that's going to come up directly in our discussion. Anybody else? All right. We have now to try to work out a functional definition of proletarian literature, in a more general sense, proletarian art, in a final sense, proletarian culture. That certainly exists as a concept, whether or not it has ever been actualized in reality. Before we can define what a proletarian novel is, or what it has been thought to be by various schools of thought, we had better give ourselves a working definition of the proletariat. And the moment we begin to do this, I think you will sense that the economic and social definition involved here has a great deal to do with the dilemmas that confronted the novelists in the 1930s. <coughs> it's very uh, easy, it's simplistic to say the proletariat consists of those people who work for a living. Obviously, there are an awful lot of people who work in this world who are not in any remote sense proletarian. The work that you do has to be of a particular sort before it acquires the character of proletarianism. It has to be seen within what Marx called the social relations of production in a modern industrial society. In Marx's view, in an industrialized world, there are enormous and constantly proliferating means of production. All the tools and machinery and equipment within a factory uh, that are used to produce goods to be sold on the open market. There are groups of human beings involved in keeping this operation going. There are sets of people who own these means of production, who control them, who manipulate them, who are in control of the products that issue from them, who sell the products, who take the money from those, that sale, uh, a portion, a part of it to themselves in the form of personal private profit, take other portions of that, those monies, use them to expand the means of production, take still other portions to maintain plant and plant equipment and to pay those people who operate the means of production. These are the proletarians in the Marxist definition. The social relationship between the owning and managerial class on the one hand and the working class on the other is that one group owns the means of production, the other owning no such means of production, hires out its labor power to the owners, the bosses, and are hired to operate tools, 
uh, machines, various sorts of equipment. <coughs> so there are two kinds of property involved in these social relations. The capitalists own physical objects called means of production and the factories that uh, house them. Workers <coughs> own only their own bodies and the potentialities of those bodies, namely the potentiality for work, for work that will so <coughs> operate the means of production owned by capitalists as to keep the economy functioning. The social relationship between the two groups of people is that of boss hiring the labor power of worker. In the technical Marxist definition, this is the proletariat. I think we had better say at once that although in the economic and social sense that definition is sufficient for our purposes, it is not enough to encompass what has happened in the proletarian novel. I would say that for our purposes, we have to go beyond the Marxist definition of functionality and consider the general human condition of different classes of people. I think that for our purposes, we must say that the proletariat embraces all the people we have been accustomed to thinking of as on the bottom economic levels, the poor, the areas of poverty, people who, whether they are working or not, could have only one function in this economic structure if they chose to work, namely to hire out their labor power as factory workers. In other words, for our purposes, I think we must say that the proletariat embraces <coughs> so totally those all the levels of the poor that the label can be applied say to the Appalachian poor many of whom have never been near a factory because as you know more and more people in that area aside from the coal miners have no function whatsoever in the world and have lived uh, developed a whole culture based on uh, minimum minimal existence derived from welfare if any of these people are able to think about gainful employment, if they can acquire some elementary skills with which they can go into cities from the countryside and begin to function on somebody's payroll, it would have to be somewhere in the area of the proletarian operation. They would have no um, equipment with which to, to work otherwise than uh, operating means of production. So I see no reason why we should not call them proletarians, even if they, if they are completely stalled in their existences, uh, are passive, drugged, slugged, completely inert. If they began to live again, they would be as proletarians. And I think for purposes of proletarian literature, it makes no difference whether your man is in a factory or uh, lying in a gutter in a slum. With the possibilities open to that man in the slum if he could get up on his feet and begin to walk around and apply for jobs would be only proletarian possibilities. That is why uh, I think it's fair to say that the novel Fat City by Leonard Gardner, whom's, which some of you may have come to look at, is a proletarian novel, though it deals largely with skid row people in the city of Stockton. Uh, people who occasionally may pull themselves out of the gin mills uh, and stagger at daybreak down to a point where trucks are uh, available, uh, getting loads of people hired day by day to take into the uh, uh, countryside and work as pickers in various agricultural areas. Uh, these people very seldom work. Uh, once in a while, they reach a state of such desperation that they will uh, 
apply for the, uh, the uh, hiring lineup in the morning, work for a day, and then come back to Skid Row existence. Uh, they're proletarians, I think. I know no other term for them. Marx made a distinction, meaningful in his time, as between the proletariat and the lumpen proletariat. The lumpen being that sodden mass of people at the very bottom who have lost all economic function because they have either been cast off by industry as it has become more and more technologized and has less and less need for absolutely unskilled labor, or because they never got close enough to the processes of education to gain the simple half literacy and the most elementary skills that would allow them to apply for jobs in industry. The lumpen proletariat, according to Marx, is that mass of people living in ghettos and slums, both uh, urban and rural, who are absolutely displaced from our social life, who are the true outcasts, who are a breeding area for crime, for all sorts of uh, antisocial or sociopathic behavior, but who, interestingly, at times of grave social crisis, at times of revolutionary upheaval, are often mobilized to participate in the most radical and violent manner in the revolutionary process, which often becomes a danger to the revolutionary process be simply because uh, having lived a subhuman condition, knowing only subhuman values or an absence of them, their aims in a revolutionary process may be pure a muckism or a momentary uh, turning of the tables, a blind striking out at a time when striking out is finally possible, a simple bloodlust. A great deal of that took place in the French Revolution, as those of you familiar with this history very well know. And some of the worst uh, bloody excesses of the uh, immediate post-revolutionary period, uh, of the Jacobin period, with those involving the slum proletariat. You're going to find some interesting complications in this analysis in recent and current political theory, the revolutionary theory in that more and more theorists of the revolutionary process are giving up on the proletariat as a whole in disgust, are becoming disillusioned with their historic role or possible role. <coughs> I think some of you will know I'm talking, talking about Herbert Marcuse, amongst others, are saying that this society of ours has so evolved, it becomes so e infriendly, elastic, as to have been able to suck up into its values and even into its satisfactions broad masses of the upper layers of the proletariat to have made them essentially middle class. Um, you'd be talking about like the uh, lower middle class blue colonies. Well, but see, technically, at least according to the Marxist definition, <coughs> to the definition of many capitalist theorists as well, the classic ones, uh, Adam Smith and uh, Ricardo and so on, blue-collar workers are not in the middle class. They don't have a middle class function. Uh, it's only when they become white-collar workers and somehow join the managerial, supervisory classes, or go beyond that and become small independent businessmen, shopkeepers and whatever, have, have either small pieces of property business that they own themselves or attach themselves to the uh, top controlling level of large businesses, only then do they become middle class. But so that the, work in, like the factories and the industry, Marcus, um, sees them as useless. Program. He thinks they've been thoroughly corrupted by capitalism, have been uh, won over, seduced by capitalism, and will never become revolutionary. Marx was wrong about that. Sociologically, there's such great difficulty actually making the distinction Intellectually, they, they almost refrain from it. But that is as important as the fact that 80% of the people in this country think they are middle class, regardless of where they really are. Sure. I don't think you can possibly explain what happened in the last election, presidential election, unless you understand that many upper level workers 
uh, highly skilled workers in the automobile industry, unionized workers, by the way, other mass industries, are so convinced that they are members of the middle class, at least the lower levels of the middle class, and are so furious at the social ferment stirred up by a black activity, militant activity of bottom dog peoples in general, that they think their newly acquired status is endangered. Without, without that explanation, you cannot understand uh, the, uh, the quite a few millions of votes that George Wallace got from the working class. Is this like the reactionary movement in Pittsburgh or something? Exactly. You know that quite a few, absolutely. You've got to notice quite a few of those people voted for George Wallace for president. Mm -hmm. See, in a sense, it was a radical vote, but that's the kind of radicalism that can lead to fascism. Mm -hmm. As it, there was that radicalism in Germany in a pre-Hitler period. I was just going to say that a lot of the what, working class reaction is, as you say, very radical. There are a lot of, you know, you put uh, leftist positions and Wallace positions, you know, and very, very similarity. The major difference is in the racist thing, which is, you know, a capitalist thing, which has been, you know, it, which divides people. Like blacks who use to strike breakers very often because they're not in unions, you know, and because they can't get into unions and all like that. Yeah. And um, I would think that it would, well, in some ways, I suppose they are threatened by the blacks' corporate <coughs> mobility. In some ways, they're best, you know, they, it's not in their interest because they are, they do serve as strike breakers and so on. So I don't know, you know, how, why does that maintain you? I think the I think the workers who have become most spectacularly racist in this country in the last few years are those who think that they've acquired enough private property interest to feel that that interest is endangered by the increasing mobility of people from traditionally at the bottom. That is to say, you may be aware of uh, an interesting uh, maverick kind of mass organizer who's been operating for 25, 30 years in this country named Saul Alinsky. Uh, he came out of the radical movement of the 1930s thinking there were a bunch of uh, crackpot idealists who didn't know how to get people together and really accomplish things. Then he set out and did some very impressive things along the way. The first thing that brought him to public attention was his very skillful organization in Chicago, what was called the, uh, the back of the stockyards, back of the yards uh, area, uh, which was uh, white immigrant for the most part. Uh, I think perhaps a few blacks, but essentially Polish immigrant, Italian, Irish, and so on. He organized them very effectively, developed a lively community interest, which led them to fight vigorously for a lot of uh, upgrading of their area, cleaning up of the place, better housing, and whatnot. And for a while, they showed considerable militancy. Well, you look at that area today, and you find some of the worst uh, uh, racism uh, in the country. Why? Because these people, having upgraded themselves, having gotten, be gotten better employment opportunities, were able, during the unprecedented prosperity of the post-war years, to buy pleasant little houses, such as they never lived in before, uh, to acquire two uh, cars per family, They've suddenly developed a stake in this economy, such as they never had before. And now, as uh, human beings spill out of the ghettos, demanding entrance in all such areas, uh, that area is threatened by an invasion of blacks. So these people are reacting not as workers, but as property owners. I think that's the first condition. Then they are also fearful, not only about a, uh, damage to their property values, they are fearful of what will happen to the educational institutions that their children go to. They fear that the violence they know about in the ghetto and so on is going to seep into, there will be violent confrontations between alien children and their children. So they have a stake in the institutions of their community as well and feel them threatened. Well, here we come to a crucial question. A good deal of the tensions and outright violences of our time seem to be organized along uh, race or ethnic lines. And the question is whether those are the fundamental lines or whether they aren't crisscrossed in many different ways by class lines. Uh, everybody has to decide this for himself. I can well understand a black militant and the Panthers or whatever at this moment 
uh, saying that to talk about the class solidarity of workers in general is absurd considering the way uh, the alleged uh, white working class responds in, the, in this Saul Alinsky area in Chicago. And that for a time at least, struggles must be conducted along uh, race lines, color lines, rather than the class lines. But you see that this is the issue that is agitating all alert and fermenting uh, people on the left today, particularly young people. It's obvious that the split in the uh, SDS is precisely over this issue or are many complicated ideological problems that flow from it. The split uh, that has generated uh, a weatherman on the one hand and uh, RIM, RYM2 on the other, are all of you familiar with these developments? Uh, has had essentially, first of all, to do with what should the primary orientation be of a student movement, more or less student movement in this country today. Should they be oriented toward working around issues that concern primarily uh, the university communities, the college uh, people themselves, university people themselves, or should they recognize in the more traditional Marxist spirit that all basic struggles that take place in the world today have to centrally involve the working class and that insofar as students want to participate meaningfully in social, uh, militant social struggle, they must ally themselves with the working class. And you see that in general, in a vague sense, the weatherman people uh, tend to concentrate more on those issues of primary concern to the academic world, whereas uh, RIM2 is saying, forget about the academic world, it's part of the whole bourgeois structure of society, get out of it as soon as possible, get into the factories, go to work in factories, join unions, and form an alliance with workers. Right. Work right. At, you know, starvation wages and right. so on, dollars sixty-five now and seven. You know, yeah. And so on. And then I don't know what, like, I don't know what the statistics on it are, because I have never seen any. But I would imagine there is a great many more workers than you would think who exist at a pretty, pretty low economic level. Oh sure. And oh sure. With virtually no job security. Sure. Like Absolutely. And then you you add to that the obvious circumstance that all rural workers yeah. uh, are neglected because they never come to your attention. The first, the first uh, attempted organization that's been of any significance is a Delano one, with Cesar Chavez. Uh, so you have several million people there. Uh, the total number of organized industrial workers, I think, is in the area of 20 or 21 million at this point. Obviously, the work, total working class is far larger than that. It's larger than the working, the working force is about 80 million, and the unionized members are only 17 million. Uh, does, are you sure it does? It doesn't go up to twenty million. I heard it just last night. <coughs> well, yeah, yeah. It may be. I thought I thought that there's been an expansion recently of the new uh, alliance uh, of uh, of the uh, auto workers and the Teamsters. Maybe there's just been exaggerated talk about it. Well, obviously, it's a uh, it's a minority of workers who are uh, organized. Any other comments? Well. By the way, another uh, extremely dramatic example of the clash between um, ethnic concerns and class concerns is in the uh, evolution of the past year or so of the Black Panthers. I think you can see there in the past year a commitment to class consciousness as against race consciousness without downgrading the need for a concern with the black community, a primary concern. Uh, nevertheless, an embracing of the traditional Marxist idea that no such minority is ever going to participate in thoroughgoing social change without a broad foundation in the working class, whatever its ethnic makeup. Uh, so I think there's an interesting, and I think, by the way, that accounts for um, uh, Stokely Mark, uh, Carmichael's dropping out because he would not make that transition. Uh, we have to add it just conceivably he's developed his own vested interests 
in uh, perpetuating uh, a base in uh, exclusively race consciousness. Uh, Most race, like the race conscious, quote unquote, cultural nationalist thing, primarily people are interested in quote unquote black capitalism, which is developing small businesses and so on. Like, for instance, in the LA ghetto, there are the, the main, you know, the US crew has some very, very money-making operations oh, sure. going in the ghetto, sure. Sure. both legal and illegal, sure. um, right. which exactly. are very vested interests, and they don't want that many. It's quite obvious that the Ron Karenga group has within it people of proletarian origin, blacks of proletarian origin, but that its spirit is, is that of middle class militancy. It is the frustration about sharing in the abundant economy and a desire to create that kind of abundance with their own in business operations and so on. Uh, I think it's inevitable that as that uh, venture proceeds, or similar ventures proceed in ghettos, you're going to find a class struggle developing within them. Because there are going to be people on the top who will be uh, garnering important profits, not all of them going back into the operations, some enhancing individual lives considerably. There are going to be others on the working class level who are going to feel increasingly exploited because they're not sharing to the extent they think they should share in the profits. I think you find some of that has already begun to happen in the Shindana factory, which was established by the Mattel Corporation in Watts to produce black dolls. There's been a bit of a class struggle within that organization. Now, I'm not laying down any law as to how this should go. I think there's going to be a lot of groping. But I don't think that class consciousness is going to be excluded from race developments in this country. I think there are going to be increasing ideological splits over the matter. I don't think, finally, that struggles are going to proceed again along such lines as to exclude uh, the possibility of a base in some area of the proletariat. Well, a further consideration is whether the proletariat can indeed have a progressive function in the world today as Marx claimed, it would have historically, right down to the end of capitalism, would indeed bring that end about. And as it did in fact have throughout the 19th century, there is the question of the decadence of the poor. I direct your attention to a book which I, I don't think I included in our reading list, which is a valuable book. You, all, you know about Michael Harrington? Well, you know, there a new business of poverty has been created in this country. Michael Harrington was the one primarily responsible for it. In other words, it has become such a massive phenomenon and one of such concern that experts have arisen, some of whom are genuinely dedicated to the question of understanding it and trying to solve it, others of whom develop their expertise in order to rise in the bureaucracy of government. As an example would be uh, Daniel Moynihan, who entered this business when he saw what a profitable one it might be, as it was established by Michael Harrington. Harrington, however, has remained a devoted socialist and is a leading member of the Socialist Party. Uh, Michael, uh, uh, Daniel uh, Moynihan was originally an undersecretary of labor in the Eisenhower administration thinking of the Johnson administration, came to attention because he succeeded in getting published a special study he did in the Department of Labor <coughs> of the psycho psychological and social problems in the ghetto, in black society as a whole. Uh, his point being that that society, in his judgment, was essentially matriarchal, made so necessarily by economic circumstance, and that it could never join the mainstream of American life until it acquired such values in its family life as the white world has, namely at least not an overt matriarchy. Uh, Moynihan now is uh, in the Nixon administration as the authority on problems of poverty, as you know. And I was primarily responsible for Nixon's speech two, three months ago announcing a new welfare policy on the federal level uh, embracing, and I think in a very feeble and minimal way, 
uh, the idea generated several years ago at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, headed by Robert Hutchins up in Santa Barbara. Very interesting uh, offbeat uh, area, institution for freewheeling intellectual exploration. There some years ago, considering precisely the problems of the poor and of the maldistribution of the profits from the gross natural national product, uh, a, uh, an interesting economist named Robert Theobald developed a formula which he thought was a way of coping with what they called the triple revolution, the second industrial revolution, or put otherwise, the revolution embracing further mechanization, automation, and cybernation. In their judgment, once these processes fulfill themselves, once the second revolution has truly been carried through, uh, industry is largely going to run by itself. The need for labor, no matter how highly skilled, is going to go steadily downward. And so there is going to be no functional basis for uh, many millions of people who have considered themselves to be workers in industry. There's going to be less and less work with more and more gross national product. And so their judgment was that this is going to pose the most fundamental challenge to the Puritan work ethic, which says that in order to be a proper, substantial, responsible human being and fulfill your human destiny, you have to work and work hard, and that you are entitled to no goods in this world unless you earn them by the sweat of your brow. The laborer is worthy of his hire, the old biblical concept, and on and on. This country has obviously been based on this concept and could not have developed without the concept. Puritanism is, in a sense, the ideology of capitalism. Uh, but if, indeed, this triple revolution is going to fulfill itself and more and more people are going to be without any job relationship to the economy, if, the, if in Marxist terms, the social relations of production are so altered that more and more people own means of production, but the means of production require few and fewer and fewer people to run them, and then we're going to have many millions of people in this country who are going to be idle. And unless we allow for their existence and encourage that existence and say that idleness or playfulness or the non-functional use of human energy, not to create things, not to bring objects into the world, but just for the sake of being active, uh, to produce whatever you want, uh, not to sell, but to cherish or give away. The substitution of play for work may be necessary. This may be the most important revolution that could possibly take place in this country and will have to take place if this new in industrial order is to be viable. In order to make a step in that direction, the people at the Center for the uh, Study of uh, Democratic Institutions, uh, Robert Theobald at their head, developed the concept of the guaranteed annual income, the GAI, saying that whether you work or not, you ought to have a regular annual income of a reasonable level, one that corresponds to the affluence of your society, to the productivity of its economy. Who's going to buy and consume the more, the greater and greater number of quantities of goods produced? If millions and millions of people do not have money, you need, you need a market. Uh, if more and more people in this country mm -hmm. can't buy things because they don't have work, what's going to happen to the, uh, the more and more uh, abundant goods that we have? They must have money, and they must get money without work. And so the logic leads to the idea that everybody must receive a certain amount of money a year, ample to human needs, or even going beyond those needs if we're that affluent. That money is not a uh, value in itself, and if it just piles up, give it away. And therefore, uh, this concept, the guaranteed annual income, leads to uh, the practical concept of the negative income tax. Namely, that you establish a certain level of income. Let's say, really affluent American society, it would be 
$8,000 a year for an average family. Then comes the end of the year, tax time. You have to fill out your tax returns. Everybody fills out a tax return. Now the people who receive these returns examine them. Anybody who's earned beyond $8,000 a year pays tax on that excess. Anybody who's earned less than $8,000 a year gets an amount of money. He doesn't have to pay money. He is sent money that will bring his income up to $8,000 a year. So this is, you see, a guaranteed annual income worked out through the institution of the um, of Internal Revenue Department. That was a little more than that, wasn't it, the negative income tax, so that it would be more profitable for you to work for $4,000 than it would for you to not work at all and get $8,000? Well, that's, that, I think, is the contribution that Nixon has presented as developed for him by uh, Moynihan. Now, that logic has been presented in the, the new welfare program. Uh, it essentially adds up to this, that government will see to it that everybody gets a certain minimal income. The minimum, I don't remember the exact figures, but for the smallest family, I think it's somewhere around $1,600, and then goes up depending on each additional member. Uh, and that it makes no difference what the source of income for that family may be. Uh, if the person derives the money from welfare, that's all right. If he derives it from working, that's all right. Uh, but to encourage him to continue to work, uh, a certain portion of his earnings through his own labor, he will be allowed to keep while the government gives him a supplementary payment, all the same. In other words, the level is not so conceived that if you go beyond it, uh, it becomes silly to work. Or you know, rather, uh, to put it another way, it is so conceived that the worker still has some stimulus to remain active in a job uh, because some of his uh, earnings can't stay in his pocket, even with the uh, supplement from the government. Uh, obviously, the Nixon formula comes nowhere near the um, more revolutionary formula worked mm -hmm. out by Robert Theobald. But it's interesting, it's an example possibly of the Marcuse logic that a revolutionary idea can be taken over, incorporated, at least in piecemeal, minimal form, into the structure of this system and under a very conservative uh, governmental regime. And with the participation of some of the, uh, the uh, new experts in the area of poverty who came out of uh, an essentially radical uh, thought process. Well, I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. Uh, mechanization, automation, cybernation. The question remains. Has the working class ever played a progressive role in history, or has it always had a, a decadent effect upon the historical process? This uh, valuable book by Michael Harrington, a brand new book, The Accidental Century, uh, published by Penguin Press, argues that in the full Marxist sense, the enormous gains and seen in a humanist sense in the 19th century, the basic thrust of historical development in the 19th century was due to the working class. That without the humanist aspirations of organized militant workers, we would not have in our society today many of the civil rights, democratic rights, that are taken as a matter of course Many of the concepts of welfareism, um, to give you some sampling of his thinking. In England and throughout the continent in the early 19th century, and in the writings of capitalist uh, political uh, theorists, an economist, workers were often referred to as hands. And it's perfectly obvious why. They were not hired as human entities, particularly on the unskilled levels. 
What was wanted was their hands and the muscle power behind their hands. Obviously, as industry became more complicated and skills became uh, increasingly complex, uh, some brain power had to be involved. The hands had to be increasingly guided by concept. Uh, and the worker had to be further trained. But still, the worker was essentially a manual worker. And this contemptuous terminology was designed to establish that he was something less than a total human being. Adam Smith wrote, the understandings of the greater part of men are necessarily formed by their ordinary employments. The man whose life is spent in performing a few simple operations has no occasion to exert his understanding. He generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human being to become. Later on in the century, Frederick Taylor, who originated a system of Taylorism, or time studies of industrial uh, worker processes, in order to make these processes more efficient, to speed up the uh, employment of hands working on machines, who led finally to uh, the mass production system in the Ford uh, factory in Detroit and other automobile plants, and then to industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. Frederick Taylor said, one of the first requirements for a man who is fit to handle pig iron is that he shall be so stupid, so phlegmatic, that he more nearly resembles an ox than any other type. This was clearly the understanding of the role and the identity of the worker that capitalism developed and would have perpetrated if there had not been mass militant resistance on the part of the working class, if they had not organized under the influence often of Marx and Engels, the various unions and then working men's associations with political uh, aims to insist that they were full human beings, that they had full human rights, and that the fragmentation of their identities in the factory system was not going to be allowed throughout the social system. And the militant struggles of organized workers in England and France and Germany and so on, and to a considerable extent in this country, whose history during the period of industrialization after the Civil War is studded with the most militant and most violent labor struggles, which many, many people died. This whole movement established that, at least in theory, that all members of society are to be treated as equally worthy human entities. It's hard for us, if we don't know the early history of capitalism, to appreciate what a brutal and brutalizing system it was. The Puritan ethic indeed said that no matter how viciously you as a, as a factory owner treated your hands, if you did it so efficiently as to realize a considerable profit, this was ordained by God because your worldly goods are granted to you uh, from by divine uh, edict and that therefore anything goes anything goes in a capitalist system the most vicious exploitation so we can say that capitalism in the 19th century was not a humanist uh, arrangement and yet the basic spirit of human development in the western world in the 19th century was humanist who then contributed the humanism it was the working class against the most vicious uh, opposition from the capitalist class. So this is our heritage. Even if we decide that the working class has lost this function in our time, it did indeed have it. And many other things that we accept as commonplaces in our lives today, free education, for example, welfare for those who need it, for example, we would not even have heard of if the working class of the 19th century had not forced them from the capitalist class and introduced them into the social order. Let's add, too, that the working class of the 19th century was not simply motivated by self-interest. Many times, under the influence of Marxist thinking, 
workers in England and Europe took positions about international matters that were against their own interests. For example, textile workers in Manchester at the time of the Civil War in the United States took a position which Marx took, they were influenced by his thinking, fully supporting the North, totally against the South and against the institution of slavery. This was at great economic cost to themselves because the cotton that they used in their textile mills, which provided them with jobs, came from the American South. Many of them lost their jobs. So you see that humanism is more than an abstract slogan. It's more than a, uh, an empty, fatuous word on a banner. Uh, an altruism, a true international solidarity has been seen at moments in the working class, such as the capitalist class has never been able to generate. I think we can leave our discussion at that point. We'll resume now with the question, next time, with the question of whether the working class has a progressive function left to it, which pro the writers of proletarian literature obviously insisted upon.